Thank you very much and good afternoon to those of you joining in person. Good morning, good afternoon or good evening to those of you joining online. And a warm welcome to all of you to this Unidir event on taking stock of the FMCT. My name is James Revel. I'm head of the WMD and Space Security Programme at Unidir, and I'm delighted to be able to moderate today's event. Um, from the outset, I should note that this event is being live streamed and recorded and we will make the recording available um, online in the coming days. Perhaps if I may provide a little bit of context. Uh, Unity has been engaged in work around the FMCT, FMCT for several years. I actually found a transcript from a 2003 event on the FMCT. It was organized by Australia, Japan, and Unity. I think it is fair to say that since 2003, there have been several initiatives to advance discussion around an FMCT. <clears throat> including through a recent initiative led by the government of Japan. We've also seen strong support from some states to commence negotiations on an FMCT, and this includes points raised earlier this month, as well as earlier this morning in the Conference on Disarmament, no less. To lay out some of the context to, to provide some op options for moving forward with an FMCT, my colleague, Dr. Pavel Podvig, has produced a discussion paper that outlines some of the issues with the negotiation of an FMCT, and lays out some of the options for states to consider in, state, in seeking to advance discussions on this important topic. That paper is available online through the UNIDIR event webpage. We also have a couple of printed copies in the room, although they may have gone. <clears throat> and there is also a QR code which provides a link to this paper. If anybody does want a copy and can't get hold of it, please do let us know and we'll be happy to provide you one of those. That paper will remain online until the end of the week. I should note this paper is a draft for discussion. In contrast to our more traditional approach of launching a completed paper, we're using this uh, event here and using the draft for discussion with a view to finalizing the report in the coming month. We're also aware there are strong views around the FMCT and we look forward to hearing more different perspectives on this topic. In order to stimulate discussion at this event, we've brought together a panel of excellent speakers and I shall begin the panel discussion shortly. This will be followed by a Q&A session where I'll invite and indeed encourage you all to provide your thoughts on this topic. But before that, I have the privilege of giving the floor to Her Excellency Ambassador Ichikawa Tomiko, Permanent Representative of Japan to the Conference on Disarmament. Thank you for joining us, Ambassador. The floor is yours, Madam. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Revil. Uh, it is my honor and pleasure to say a few words of welcome to this hybrid seminar organized by UNIDIR. Japan is pleased to cooperate with UNIDIR on this very important research project. We are also very happy with the way the study is being conducted in an open and inclusive manner, including organizing today's event and providing us with a working draft. Uh, given the severe international security environment, limiting the quantitative improvement of nuclear weapons is becoming even more urgent and important. And FMCT can contribute to this objective by banning the production of fissile materials for use in nuclear weapons or other explosive devices. Strong political will is needed to break the impasse and commence the negotiations on an FMCT. To this end, Japan has been leading several initiatives. Australia, Japan, and the Philippines co-hosted a high-level event during the UN General Assembly High-Level Week in September last year to refocus political attention on the FMCT. Last week, at the ministerial briefing of the UN Security Council on nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation under the Japanese presidency, Foreign Minister Kamikawa announced the establishment of the FMCT Friends. This is a cross-regional group which aims to maintain and enhance political attention on an FMCT and to contribute to expand the support for the negotiation. Japan's support for this research project is another demonstration of our commitment to an FMCT. I hope 
this seminar will provide a useful platform to take stock of the past debate, deepen discussions, and promote wider understanding of the re related challenges and opportunities. It is also our strong hope that today's event and the research project will contribute to building momentum for the commencement of the negotiation on an FMCT. With our heartfelt gratitude for UNIDIL for the research project and today's event, I look forward to a lively and fruitful exchange of ideas. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for your remarks, for your kind and encouraging words, and of course, for your support for this project. Um, I'd now like to turn to Dr. Pavel Podvig, a senior researcher in the WMD program at UNIDIR. Um, Pavel is going to provide an overview of the draft report. So with that, Pavel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks uh, everyone for uh, coming and or joining us uh, online. Uh, and of course, uh, thanks uh, to uh, Japan for supporting this uh, project. Uh, of course, the interest in FMCT goes uh, much farther than uh, 2003 that uh, Jamie mentioned. Uh, in, indeed, uh, it's been now more than 30 years since the UN General Assembly uh, adopted the resolution that started uh, the, uh, the process. And uh, to some extent, the interest in the uh, idea uh, is uh, because the idea seems uh, so simple, straightforward, and actually within reach. Uh, in practice, of course, uh, the reality uh, turned out to be a little bit more uh, difficult. Uh, another reason for the interest is that there is, uh, there is already uh, a lot of material out there. Uh, as uh, you can see from uh, the open data, uh, we can uh, estimate that there is uh, uh, more than 1,200 uh, uh, metric tons of uh, HEU, uh, most of which is uh, more than 1,000 tons, uh, is in fact available for weapons, uh, and uh, more than uh, 500 tons of plutonium, uh, and of which less but still a significant part, about 140 tons, of uh, plutonium is available for weapons. And uh, given that uh, a nuclear weapon uh, contains uh, kilograms of uh, material, uh, this, is a, this is a lot of weapons. And uh, of course, uh, the, uh, this material is not evenly distributed, uh, and some states, uh, and this is another reason for uh, the interest, and some states are either producing the material uh, or have the capacity to do so. Uh, yes, uh, on the positive side, uh, we have four states that uh, declared a moratorium on uh, fissile material production for weapons, uh, but let's, uh, to be honest, uh, they've done so because uh, they have uh, a lot more material that they could possibly use. Uh, which doesn't mean that uh, states that haven't joined the moratorium actually need more material. And uh, like, and there is no magic amount of uh, weapon-grade plutonium or uh, HEU that would make uh, a state secure. In each case, uh, you can actually make a good argument uh, that uh, stopping uh, fissile material production for weapons uh, is perfectly compatible uh, with national security objectives of uh, every uh, each, each country. Uh, and indeed, uh, FMCT uh, can be part of that argument uh, because building the regime uh, that bans uh, production could be an important uh, factor in creating the circumstances when uh, the production actually uh, is stopped. And of course, uh, in these 30 years, uh, there, there's been a lot of work uh, done on the issue. Uh, we've uh, had uh, the group of governmental experts, the high-level expert group. Uh, we had discussions uh, uh, in, in the CD and other fora. Uh, we had a number of uh, draft treaties, uh, some of which were submitted by uh, states. And of course, uh, there, there was a, a lot of academic research uh, done on, on the subject. Uh, we, uh, I think it would be fair to say that we know uh, most of the issues. Uh, we know most of national positions, uh, and uh, we have some idea of uh, what, is, uh, what is blocking uh, the uh, commencement uh, of uh, negotiations. However, uh, 
the circumstances uh, around the uh, ban on production change, uh, we, it is clear that uh, the situation today is very different from what it was in 93 uh, uh, or 2003 or even uh, uh, 2013 or 14. Uh, and I would probably say that our expectations of what the treaty can or cannot do and what the treaty should or should not do uh, also change. And uh, that uh, means that it is, it is useful, it is important to uh, go back and uh, ask uh, some questions uh, again. Uh, and maybe uh, this time uh, the answer might be different uh, or uh, we uh, could find uh, value in uh, issues that uh, we haven't thought about uh, before. So uh, what I will try to do, I will try to cover some of the issues uh, that are uh, raised in the context, context uh, of uh, FMCT, uh, although, of course, I, I do not pretend to cover them all or to uh, cover the most important ones. Uh, I think this is a, uh, this is a selection of, uh, of, of questions uh, that, that are out there. Uh, and some of them uh, have been discussed in uh, various uh, fora, uh, like GG or high-level group, uh, but uh, we at UNIDIR are here. Uh, we have the luxury of not being constrained by uh, the uh, by national positions, and we can uh, afford uh, be uh, maybe a little bit more uh, proactive in a circuit in. Uh, uh, Making uh, making certain points, although of course uh, the the purpose of this uh, process is for us to get a better understanding uh, of uh, national positions and uh, to make sure that we, uh, when uh, as we do our research, that we uh, respect them. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, let me just uh, start uh, with the, with a note that when I when I when I talk about the FMCT, uh, I use FMCT as an uh, acronym that is just convenient, sort of, without prejudice to uh, the whether it's a cutoff or not, or maybe that there might be a totally different name for the arrangement. So. Uh, and uh, when we uh, when we look at the issues, I think that one uh, and probably uh, one of the key ones uh, is uh, whether the FMCT should be a disarmament treaty, uh, whether uh, it should include specific obligations regarding elimination of, uh, of fissile materials uh, and the mechanism uh, that would uh, demand uh, the elimination uh, of its parties. And I would say, uh, ideally, uh, yes. I guess we all agree that uh, at some uh, at some point we, we will arrive to that destination. Uh, but uh, at the same time, I think the uh, a better maybe question uh, to ask about the uh, uh, FMCT is: uh, Would the uh, treaty make sense uh, if it does not include specific obligations regarding uh, regarding uh, elimination of materials? And I, I would argue that uh, the answer to that is yes. Uh, and uh, the reason for that is that if you uh, look at the way that uh, the potential treaty can be uh, constructed, can be designed, uh, to make sure that it does uh, what it's supposed to do, uh, which is to prohibit uh, production of fissile materials for weapons, uh, it is uh, clear that uh, the, the way to do that, and I would argue the only way to do that, is to uh, uh, create a mechanism that would uh, make sure that whatever material is produced uh, is followed uh, through its entire life cycle uh, and under international control, uh, and that system uh, in, ensures that the material uh, cannot and is not uh, used uh, for weapons. And once you build that uh, mechanism, I would uh, argue that uh, that mechanism becomes uh, an important part of the uh, entire regime, uh, and uh, you can use that mechanism to actually elim to uh, uh, eliminate uh, already existing uh, weapon stocks. Uh, because uh, in many ways, uh, new material uh, is not uh, the, all that different from the uh, material produced in, in the past. Uh, one example uh, that I uh, like to use uh, in that in that regard is uh, the example of the 
uh, plutonium disposition program, the uh, U.S.-Russian agreement, uh, plutonium management and disposition agreement, uh, and at which uh, both states uh, pledge to eliminate 34 metric tons of uh, weapon origin plutonium each. Uh, and uh, that agreement had a difficult life uh, and eventually fell apart for a variety of reasons. Uh, but had the FMCT been in, in place, uh, it would it could have accepted that material for elimination and that material could have been eliminated, uh, verifiably eliminated under international control. Uh, and that mechanism of that process would not have depended on the uh, uh, US, uh, US Russian relations, which uh, unfortunately can, uh, can be uh, difficult uh, at times. So, uh, and uh, let me, Emphasize again the the, uh, the the value of FMCT uh, in my view uh, is not necessarily in uh, uh, mandating uh, the uh, elimination of materials, but rather in creating a, a mechanism for uh, for doing so. Related, uh, although I would argue a different issue, uh, and which uh, most of you uh, know, uh, is the issue of stocks. Uh, normally, uh, it is framed uh, as a question of whether FMCT should include stocks or, or not in its scope. And uh, I think the uh, question to ask here is actually, uh, what if it does? What if the treaty includes stocks? And what if it does not? What would change? And surprisingly, in my view, uh, the difference would not be very, uh, very, uh, very important. Uh, from the practical point of view, uh, if you, whether you include the stocks or not, uh, unless you have a mechanism of mandating uh, the total elimination of material, which I would argue would be a, a different a task for a different treaty, unless you have that mechanism, uh, you would still be uh, in uh, eliminating uh, material. You would be limited by uh, looking either at the material that states voluntary uh, declare excess for their uh, military uh, or weapon needs, uh, or you would uh, deal with the disarmament material, uh, which is the material that states would commit to elimination as, as a result of, uh, for example, uh, some bilateral or multilateral or uh, other uh, uh, disarmament agreements. Uh, in both cases, uh, again, uh, the it is much more important uh, for, to have a mechanism that could deal with this material than to have a mechanism that would uh, tell the uh, states which uh, material they uh, must uh, eliminate. What the inclusion of stocks, uh, the inclusion of stocks can make uh, a significant difference uh, when it comes to uh, accountability. Uh, and uh, the, for in, the, in the process of uh, eliminating or managing uh, fissile materials. And to do so, uh, the treaty, uh, and that would be a significant value added, uh, the treaty uh, should require a declaration of, of stocks. Uh, this, of course, uh, it is a challenging task because as we know, uh, the, the reality is that uh, for uh, most states, uh, a significant part of that, uh, their fissile material stocks is in weapons or in uh, weapon-related uh, activities or has uh, uh, sensitive attributes or characteristics. However, uh, I think that that challenge uh, can be dealt with. We've done some work uh, uh, on that, uh, the, uh, and we developed the approach that is called deferred verification that allows you to uh, declare stocks verifiably and build a system of accountability. Uh, and uh, that that is uh, that is an important, uh, in my view, uh, if we are talking about including stocks in the treaty, uh, that is uh, what we uh, need to talk about. Accountability uh, also helps uh, with the another issue that's been raised uh, in relation to uh, the uh, FMCT, uh, namely transfers of material. Uh, as I said, materials are unevenly distributed, and uh, the treaty, uh, it is uh, widely understood, and there is a, this position is supported by uh, a majority of states, uh, 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 that the treaty should include the mechanisms that would prevent transfer of material uh, between, uh, between states. 
Uh, abandoned transfer uh, is would be difficult to verify uh, if we're talking about material uh, that is dedicated for uh, weapon purposes. But that doesn't mean that, that <clears throat> this kind of a ban would be meaningless. Uh, it is, uh, we, we know other bans that are difficult to verify. And also, I would note that uh, the arrangement like a deferred verification uh, can actually uh, deter uh, and eventually verify uh, the, uh, the, uh, the transfers of this kind. So uh, that's the weapon, uh, uh, weapon stocks. Uh, when we're talking about uh, transfers of material uh, for non-weapon purposes, uh, then uh, the situation is uh, slightly different. Uh, and uh, we can, and we've seen the examples of uh, uh, states uh, transferring material for civilian uses. Uh, some of uh, that is reasonably transparent. For example, Russia supplied uh, HEU for research reactors to, uh, to Europe, where it is under URLM safeguards. Uh, in other cases, it's less transparent. Uh, for example, when Russia supplied uh, HEU for uh, breeder reactors in China, uh, but it's uh, reasonably transparent. We know it's on, the, on trade records and, and all that, so it's not, uh, it's not difficult to, tra to, to, to trace. Uh, more difficult is uh, the material that is transferred for military, uh, but non-proscribed uses, uh, in particular for uh, naval reactors, for example. Uh, and here again, the FMCT can uh, include the mechanisms that would make uh, these transfers uh, accountable, traceable, uh, and the mechanisms that would make sure that uh, the material uh, that is transferred for these purposes uh, cannot be used uh, for weapons in the uh, on the recipient side. Of course, uh, if if it is if the recipient is a non uh, non nuclear weapon state uh, member of the NPT, uh, there is an IAA mechanism there that is that can work as well. But uh, by adding uh, the FMCT accounting accountability. Uh, you can make uh, that kind of arrangement uh, stronger. And of course, you can make this arrangement stronger if, if we're talking about transfers uh, between uh, nuclear weapon states uh, in the NPT. And finally, uh, let me say a couple of words uh, about uh, another issue that is not exactly uh, FMCT related, but it is discussed uh, very often in the in the context, uh, which is a transparency uh, and confidence building measures. And as you know, uh, the uh, UN General Assembly adopted a resolution that called for uh, uh, states to engage in uh, discussions on the issue. Uh, the these are not, of course, uh, a substitute to uh, legal or institutional arrangements, but they could provide, uh, and they should provide, an important blueprint for uh, many measures uh, that can be included in the, F in the FMCT. Uh, for example, uh, the, uh, uh, the account of plutonium and HEU stocks and, and history of plutonium and HEU that was provided by uh, the United States and uh, the United Kingdom actually provides you, uh, it could serve as a model declaration uh, for uh, the kind of declaration uh, I mentioned earlier uh, in the FMCT. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, and also uh, this, this example uh, tells us uh, the difficulties and challenges that the states may encounter when they will be making these declarations. Uh, another, uh, although it's not entirely uh, uh, transparency and capitalism building, but uh, we have a very important uh, experience of monitoring uh, weapon, uh, weapon grade material, for example, uh, a significant amount of uh, Russian uh, weapon-grade plutonium is under monitoring by the uh, inspectors, by the U.S. inspectors as part of the uh, agreement that shut down plutonium production reactors. The PMDA is a plutonium management and disposition agreement also, also uh, is a very valuable example of how you can approach uh, the issue of eliminating the stocks. So uh, that is... Uh, uh, as I said, uh, these uh, these measures provide a very important uh, 
lessons uh, for the future. Uh, there are also a number of existing uh, mechanisms uh, that already exist and that can be strengthened or even expanded. Uh, one important example is the uh, civilian plutonium declarations uh, known as uh, INFSERC 549 uh, that uh, provide accountability regarding civilian, uh, civilian plutonium. Uh, it's not secret that when China suspended uh, its uh, reporting in uh, 2017, uh, that created uncertainty about the uh, dimensions of the, uh, of the program in China. Uh, and uh, again, we know the, uh, China's view on the issue about transparency in general, uh, but uh, I would argue, and I think we would all agree, that resuming that, that reporting would go a long way to uh, addressing uh, whatever uncertainty uh, might be there. Uh, and uh, this is an important uh, mechanism, and uh, there is no reason why other states cannot join it, uh, not not all states uh, have separated plutonium, but you, you could still, uh, the, uh, the mechanism allows you to report uh, the plutonium uh, in irradiated fuel. Uh, that, that could provide uh, a, 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 an important level of transparency. Uh, you can go even further. You could go and uh, submit more, more detailed declarations. Uh, take an example uh, of Japan. Uh, that actually publishes a very detailed account of its plutonium program, and it's, uh, it also it is very helpful. Uh, and speaking of Japan and uh, other uh, non-nuclear uh, non weapon states, uh, we can, they could make uh, a contribution to strengthening the uh, transparency and confidence-building confidence uh, measures as well. Uh, again, uh, there is another reporting uh, mechanism uh, in CERC uh, 912, uh, which uh, 20 countries uh, committed to report uh, their uh, stocks of highly enriched uranium. Uh, and that mechanism may use some help uh, because so far only Norway and Australia submitted their declarations. Uh, although France, UK, and Germany have submitted this information as part of their plutonium reporting. So uh, you can imagine that uh, if more countries join these uh, reporting mechanisms, uh, that uh, the kind of the overall uh, transparency uh, norm uh, will, be, will be strengthened. And, and again, we can learn uh, important lessons uh, that could help us uh, moving toward uh, FMC. So, and uh, to end here, uh, of course, you could say that after 30 years, it's difficult to be optimistic about FMCT. And, uh, uh, but at the same time, I think uh, it is important uh, that uh, we see uh, there is interest, there is support uh, for the treaty. We know that it is not a universal support. Uh, there are uh, states that uh, object the idea, uh, but even having this discussion and uh, discussing these issues, uh, that, uh, that is a way of uh, creating, uh, creating the uh, environment uh, in which, uh, as a, again, uh, FMCT uh, can become an important element, uh, a valuable and important and valuable element of the uh, disarmament uh, regime. Let me stop here. And again, thank you for coming. Thanks. Thank you, Pavel. I think this provided considerable food for thought for colleagues here. I also suspect you've stimulated or indeed provoked some comments or questions. Um, I would ask, though, unless anybody has any quick points they want to raise or points of clarification, that we take all questions at the end of all the presentations. So unless anybody has any, any particular quick points they'd like to raise. I can't see any so far. So with that in mind, I'd now like to turn to Mr. Thomas Fetz. Um, I don't think Thomas requires any introduction for most of you in the room, uh, but just in case, Thomas is the Deputy Permanent Representative to the Conference of Disarmament of the Permanent Mission of Canada to the United Nations and the Conference of Disarmament. And also, I should probably add just personally, Thomas, my apologies for mistitling you in some of the promotional material um, that's been changed moving forward, but my apologies. And the floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Jamie. Uh, good afternoon, excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank UNIDIR for organizing this panel discussion and inviting me as a panelist. I also want to thank uh, Dr. Pavel Podvik for writing this report. It's a thought-provoking paper, uh, which uh, has also triggered um, 
some thoughts in my mind and undoubtedly will uh, will do that for others. And of course, I also want to thank uh, Japan for funding uh, this event and for funding this research. And I want to thank my fellow panelists for their engagement on uh, FNCT. As Pavel pointed out, it has indeed been already more than 30 years since the adoption of ANGA Resolution 4875L, which called for the negotiation of an FMCT back in December 1993. And we will soon reach the 30th anniversary of the Shannon Mandate CD1299, which provided for the creation of an ad hoc committee in the CD to negotiate an FMCT. Of course, since then, we had all kinds of uh, activities. Pavel already uh, mentioned some of those. The idea of controlling fissile materials for producing nuclear weapons actually goes back much further, back to the Eisenhower days in the United States. We had the 1946 Atchison Lilienthal report, and uh, that advocated for an atomic agency Atomic Development Agency to regulate fissile material. Of course, we also had uh, support for um, controlling fissionable uh, materials during the 1978 ANGA Special Session on Disarmament. Um, we had uh, endorsements by successive uh, NPT review conferences, 1995, 2000, 2005, and 2010. And of course, we had the GG uh, from 2014 to 2015, and then the FMCT expert preparatory group uh, from 2017 to 18, as Pavel already mentioned. And then, of course, we had sub subsidiary bodies in the city in 2017 to 2022. So despite all these efforts, and at the beginning, quite strong, even unanimous support, for negotiations on an FMCT, we, are, we now seem to be further away from negotiating than, than perhaps ever before. So much work remains to be done, and I believe that the paper by Dr. Podrick uh, makes, makes a positive contribution to uh, what we can do on FMCT. Now, his paper covers all the key issues, including production, transfer of fissile materials, existing stocks, verifiable disarmament, and transparency and confidence building measures. I'm sure there are others, but, but we believe those are, those are the key issues. Um, I very much agree with the sentiment expressed in his paper that irrespective of whether existing stocks are included, a treaty on fissile materials would be an important step towards nuclear disarmament. A world free of nuclear weapons would be impossible without, without an effective ban on the production of fissile materials for weapons. So I applaud the paper for outlining ideas that go beyond a one-size-fits-all approach. It may be useful to deal with fissile materials for nuclear weapons in a step-by-step -step manner. And in that respect, I also want to mention the proposal by Brazil made in document CD 1888 to establish a framework treaty and two protocols one on future production and one on, fa on, on past production. That may be a possible avenue for moving forward, taking into account that there are diverse interests among states. Oh. Uh, I also agree with the paper that the difference between prohibiting future uh, production only and including existing stocks, uh, that, that this, these differences are not irreconcilable. <laughs> There are options, perhaps, for an in-between and interim measures that could be taken even if they fall short of resolving the issue of fissile materials immediately and completely. For example, as, uh, as Pavel mentioned, a treaty that includes the partial elimination of stocks, declarations of holdings, the regulation of transfers, and an international mechanism for the verifiable elimination of excess materials would presumably make the world a better place, even if it does not uh, include the complete elimination of stocks and perhaps not even the complete elimination of any production. But if limits can be set, that might be an interim step that could perhaps be taken. Uh, the section 
in the paper that deals with excess materials is a good reminder that we should not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. A treaty could create a legal, institutional, tech and technical mechanism for the elimination of fissile materials. And a cutoff would need the machinery for verifying that newly produced material is not diverted to nuclear weapons. This machinery could then also apply, be applied to existing materials, as Pavel mentioned, for elimination, or whether it's the, this is done voluntarily or by way of a disarmament agreement. As we know, in the multilateral context, we generally do not have uh, treaties and agreements that reduce the amount of nuclear weapons, and perhaps we won't have a treaty that, that it reduces or eliminates fissile materials. But perhaps you can have such treaties amongst a smaller group of states, and they could then make the materials that are designed for decommissioning available to this FMCT mechanism to ensure effective internationally supervised um, elimination of, the, of these materials. Now, the paper acknowledges that verification procedures will be challenging, and, uh, but that they are likely not insurmountable. The high-level FMCT preparatory group also concluded that verification procedures and institutional models require further work, but they do not have to be determined before the negotiations. Perhaps not everything has to be verifiable immediately, and stocks do not have to be reduced to zero immediately. Of course, as we get closer to zero, verification becomes more important. Even in the absence of verification, as was mentioned, a binding commitment to reduce or eliminate stocks could nevertheless be included in a treaty and could have some value in getting us closer to complete nuclear disarmament. After all, the NPT disarmament obligations are not very specific either, and we have no verification mechanism uh, for the BWC. That does not mean that these two treaties have no value for disarmament, just because effective and complete verification is missing. Now, transfers is a challenging issue, as, as has been well explained in the paper, but once again, that can perhaps be addressed in the negotiations, and the way forward may, may include an arrangement that strengthens the IAEA procedures. We also agree that transparency and confidence building measures are an important step, especially as negotiations are not close. The 2023 anger resolution on FMCT is clear in calling for such transparency and confidence building measures. Uh, effective TCBMs can, one hopes, narrow the gaps and create a path towards negotiations. TCBMs can also be advanced unilaterally, aiming to encourage reciprocity. Of course, one can, uh, can disagree the, uh, in terms of uh, where negotiations stand in the CD. The paper says that negotiations on an FMCT in the CD remain uncertain. Uh, that language, in my view, is uh, rather diplomatic. Unfortunately, the chances of immediate FMCT negotiations in, uh, in the CD are almost non-existent given the lack of political will and the determination of some states to continue producing fissile materials for nuclear weapons. That manifests itself by expanding nuclear arsenals and the refusal by some states to declare and adhere to a moratorium on the production of fissile materials. That said, I can only reinforce the point made on page 20 of the paper, which says, while some of the issues that hold back the FMCT negotiations may present a serious challenge. The differences are not necessarily irreconcilable and virtually all technical problems can be adequately addressed. Given the benefits of an FMCT, given the benefits an FMCT could generate, it is, it is essential to continue the discussion and engage in a cooperative search for solutions that can give new momentum, new momentum to the FMCT process. Now I would like to touch briefly on, on, uh, on some of the challenges of getting to negotiations and, and Canada's position. Among the stated reasons for the deadlock in the CD is the disagreement over the mandate given in CD 1299. 
Ambassador Gerald Shannon was aware that states had different views as to whether existing stocks should be included in the negotiations. It is important to note that his, in his report, the ambassador included a caveat, and I'm sure all of you are aware, that says the mandate for the, for the establishment of the ad hoc committee does not preclude any delegation from raising for consideration in the ad hoc committee any of the above noted issues. In short, he was of the view that existing stocks could indeed be considered during the negotiations, not just raised, but considered. It is therefore Canada's view that the Shannon mandate continues to provide an adequate vehicle for commencing negotiations on a treaty on fissile materials for nuclear weapons. In our view, the issue of existing stocks should not be used as a barrier to start negotiations, but this issue, like other potential elements of a treaty, should be sorted out at the negotiating table. A lot of preparatory work has been done for this treaty, as has been outlined again today, and is, it is time now to stop pre-negotiating and to get to actual negotiations, including on whether stock should be part of the treaty or not. We also call on states to drop, we also call on other states to drop conditions which impede the commencement of negotiations. States would have ample opportunity to protect their interests at the negotiating table and when deciding whether to sign or ratify an eventual treaty. We should commence negotiations now so that we can implement the treaty, perhaps in part provisionally first, and completely when the political will is there. So I think the paper that Pavel provided us gives us additional food for thought of how we should address some of these issues in an eventual treaty. If we cannot agree on certain things, perhaps we can uh, provide for the treaty to enter into force step by step. Perhaps we can tackle some of the issues in the treaty by way of provisional implementation first. Of course, an example that we have is the CTBT. And that may also perhaps show an avenue for implementing some of the steps that, ha that Pavel has suggested in a treaty uh, dealing with fissile, fissile materials. The treaty in and of itself could follow the Brazilian model and perhaps aim for, for a maximum goal in, in both of these protocols that Brazil is proposing. But if we can't get there, if states can't agree to that, perhaps we can uh, provide for some interim steps to be taken. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. I suspect we'll come back to many of the points that you've raised around framework treaties, the options you laid out and step-by-step -step approach, as well as verification, uh, among other things, uh, shortly. Did anybody have any points of clarification they wish to put to Thomas? Can't see any. So I suggest that uh, if we could now turn to Alonso. Um, Alonso, I think, will be, again, well known to many of you, but Alonso is a councillor with the Permanent Mission of Mexico to the UN and other organisations. Alonso, thank you for joining us, and the floor is yours, sir. Well, firstly, uh, I would like to thank you, Nidir, for the invitation. Obviously, I feel honoured to be here, while at the same time, I feel I'm like stepping in a swamp here yeah. with the discussions of MMCT, but... But no, thank you for the invitation. Firstly, to recognize, obviously, the historical work that UNIDIR has been doing in this topic, which has been always been constant of high quality on the issue of FMCT. And I think that Pavel Potsvik's discussion paper is just the latest iteration of this substantive work by, by UNIDIR. Would also like to recognize the strong support of Japan generally to the issue of FMCT. We know that uh, they have been uh, providing uh, inputs and financial uh, support for the studies within UNIDIR. And obviously, we listened to Foreign Minister Yoko Kamikawa in the Security Council make it a priority. And finally, well, I feel honored to be here together with Canada that has certainly been championed on the issue of FMCT 
for many years and a recognition to Thomas that clearly you're following on the footsteps of Thomas Shannon, Elisa Goldberg, and Heidi Hunan. So, so, well, so first, uh, I'm not going to enter into the historical precedents, and I think Thomas has uh, very uh, well uh, established, obviously, it's from the Baruch Plan, from uh, SSOD1, General Assembly Resolutions, TPN, N, MPT and TPNW as precedents for obviously that are relevant for this issue. And Mexico has been always a supporter of all these initiatives. And we have been part of the GGE, we have been part of the expert preparatory work, and we have also presented, for example, work, uh, working papers on the CD. Uh, I can rem I can remember one in 2011 that we presented with Bulgaria, Germany, Spain, and other states on, on the issue. So, so obviously it's an, a topic on which we have been interested for a long time. I think our, I think going the reverse, I say first our position and then our comments with Pavel uh, papers. So obviously the Mexican position is clear, has been well known. And firstly, we recognized that the FMCT is an essential element of any comprehensive framework of mutually reinforcing instruments aimed at achieving and maintaining a world free of nuclear weapons. We also understand that an FMCT instrument should serve to halt both the horizontal and vertical proliferation of nuclear weapons and also serve for the purpose of nuclear disarmament. Regarding the scope of the treaty, I think from any, any meaningful FMCT would have to, to have a differentiated obligation. So, it would certainly need to prohibit any future production, any and all future production of fissile material for nuclear weapons or nuclear explosive devices. It would also require that the placement of all civilian stocks that are of a feasible uh, nature under verification safeguards to ensure that they are not diverted also would require all of the placement of non-civilian stock declared in excess under verification safeguards and towards reprocessing for civilian use, again, to avoid its diversion. It would need to deal with the destruction and conversion to peaceful uses of facilities previously used for production of fissile material for nuclear weapons or nuclear explosive devices. It should prohibit transfers and acquisition of fissile material and technology. And finally, it should decide on uh, measures of accountability, control, reprocessing, containment, and if possible, elimination of functional stocks of fissile materials for nuclear weapons. So therefore, I think from this, comprehensive vision that Mexico has of an MC, FMCT instrument. It deals both with past production, which would mean stocks, but also facilities, as well as future production. And we feel this is justified, firstly, doctrinally. We feel that there's need to be progress towards nuclear disarmament. And it, measures should be built not just for non-proliferation, not just for non-proliferation, and to leave untouched the status quo on the possession of nuclear weapons as established in the NPT. We should feel that there are measures that should be built towards the fulfillment of Article Six of the NPT. But also, we feel that there are practical measures on why we need to have this approach. If the FMCT does not deal with existing material. Firstly, any instrument that deals with only with future production might be an incentive for states to produce as much possible to produce as much possible of this material before joining the treaty. Second, it is important 
to deal with existing stocks that are in excess to military requirements to ensure that they will never return to nuclear weapon stocks. We also feel that there are important stocks of highly enriched uranium or other military uses, uh, might be, for example, for naval propulsion, which should be ensured that they will not and cannot be used for nuclear weapons. So I think on that basis, how do we see uh, the guiding principles that are commonly agreed when we are dealing with the FMCT? I think here, firstly, we understand that it should be non-discriminatory in the sense that the obligations should apply equally to all state parties and with Rect rectify the inequities under the MPT regarding safeguard obligations. We also understand that it would need to be verifiable, that it would be able to deter and detect non-compliance in timely manner and provide credible assurances. Oops, the chronogram stopped, so I'm not really sure how much I have. My... So this obviously verification will imply a variety of tools and techniques and adopted to specific obligations that might be agreed in an instrument and the different context. And finally, it should be multilateral and that should involve in the negotiation both nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states. Another criteria that any negotiation of an FC, FMCT should follow is that it should be complementary and non-duplicative of other frameworks that exist. So it should use as much as possible and feasible previous experiences of the IAEA, and I can, I can think of definitions of safeguards or the use of laboratories and qualified staff, amongst others. And also it might learn from other frameworks, be the CTBT, the, the CWC, oh, the work of the OPCW, for example, recognizing the differences of on material, fissile material and chemical material, but I think there might be lessons there. Our position with regard to the start of negotiations. So Mexico, as I have explored, has explained, we have a certainly uh, a defined position of what we understand should be an FMCT instrument. But at the same time, we are open to start negotiations in a constructive spirit and without preconditions or on due restrictions to garner agreements based on both political, legal, and technical and scientific considerations. We, from a Mexico perspective, understand that the Shannon mandate does give the appropriate leeway to start the negotiations. And obviously, it will imply a very uh, uh, strenuous work from all different strains of expertise and knowledge. Uh, so now with regard to, to Pavel's discussion paper, I think here, uh, I think it is clear from, from the paper that it certainly understands the complexities that any negotiation of FMCT would encounter. So I think I would just highlight, for example, with regard to scope. So, so we, we read and uh, we are very interested in his idea that it, it identifies that regardless of the outcome of an eventual FMCT, a process of on the scope, any process of verification would be a useful parameter to both existing stocks and f future production and even other verification needs. So I, I read with interest, for example, that in the paper he makes exemplifies also with a reference to disarmament material, which I think in general within the GG of FMCT and of the discussions is generally understood by all to be outside of the scope of an FMCT. But it recognizes that verification that might be included in any negotiation of an FMCT might be important. 
I think another aspect of Pavel's paper, which I think is, is, is this, the issue of effectiveness. And I think here, what we saw, I read, it's that an instrument even for non-proliferation would, would need to deal not only with production, because it's not the only source of, uh, of material, but also with transfers and acquisitions. And I think that is also coincidental with what we envision as a comprehensive framework of uh, MCT. Another aspect of, of the paper I liked is this differentiated approach that measures regarding stocks and future production need to be complementary, but not identical. And so there will also be a need for specific needs uh, of verification, for example, with regard to civilian use for non-civilian use uh, in excess and for the destruction and conversion of production fa facilities. So, there's a differentiated approach that you will need to the different obligations. And finally, I think another aspect of Pavel's paper that I find interesting is the need to be innovative. So any need on approaching a negotiation of an FMCT would be necessarily, uh, as he well said, it's the idea of an MCT, FMCT seems relatively simple. <laughs> But its negotiation and its application, it's there that will require innovative, both technical, legal, and institutional solutions. And I think his paper starts building into these more nuanced visions of what will actually a negotiation of a FMCT entail. So we certainly see it as a very valuable input that complements obviously enormous work that has been done in the sphere of FMCT, but in certainly we feel it's an important work. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alonso, for the Mexican position and the, the discussant role. Uh, I, I also have some sympathy for the, the challenge of stepping into a swamp. It sometimes feels at the moment like anything on arms control, disarmament or security more generally, so incredibly sensitive and never know what's lurking beneath. Um, did anybody have any points of clarification they'd like to raise uh, to Alonso at all? If not, I suggest we turn to our last speaker. Okay, uh, so if we can now turn to Professor Nishida Michiru from the School of Global Humanities and Social Sciences at Nagasaki University. Uh, Professor Nishida is also a senior research advisor to the Asia Pacific Leadership Network and has many years of experience in the field of arms control, disarmament and non-proliferation. So we're greatly looking forward to hearing from you, sir. And you have both the screen and the room, if everything works. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank the Yingdir for having me speak for this important panel. Uh, I've been asked to give a Japanese perspective on an FMCT. Um, here, I'd just uh, like to make it clear that I'm not a Japanese diplomat anymore, uh, as opposed to the other panelists being diplomats of their countries. Uh, so I don't represent the Japanese government uh, here, and therefore my remark uh, does not necessarily represent the views of the Japanese government. Uh, and thank you, Pavel, for the very useful paper. Uh, the, paper, the, the way of thinking is very much in line with my perspective, at least, and uh, with Japan's uh, perspective, as far as I see from Japanese working papers in the past. Uh, today, I'd like to talk about, uh, first, uh, the significance of an FMCT today in light of the recent security environment. Second, uh, perspectives in considering how an FMCT should look like. And uh, <clears throat> finally, possible ways forward. So first, uh, uh, the significance of an FMCT. Um, there are many significances of an FMCT, uh, five or six at least I can think of. Uh, here I'd like to just point out two amongst others. Uh, the first significance is the role of an FMCT to uh, curtail nuclear expansion in the era of nuclear buildup. Um, as the uh, working paper by uh, Pablo shows, one of the major debate about an FMCT has been 
whether it is a nuclear disarmament treaty or a nuclear non-proliferation treaty. Uh, and there have been criticisms that um, if it's not a nuclear disarmament treaty, it has a little meaning. Uh, but in the era of nuclear disarmament in the post-Cold War era, uh, nuclear disarmament was um, expected to move forward even without an FNCT. And the opinion that an FNCT looks insufficient and that a treaty with more impact, such as the TPNW, uh, is more desirable than an FNCT, may have had some persuasive power. However, um, in order to promote nuclear disarmament in the current era of nuclear expansion, it is for, first and foremost uh, necessary to halt nuclear buildup. Um, thus, the significance of an FMCT, even as a small step to at least halt nuclear expansion, is increasing. The next uh, significant aspect of FMCT is the mitigation of the discriminatory nature uh, represented by the NPT. The most effective way to mitigate the discriminatory nature is, of course, to maximize the FMCT's utility as a nuclear disarmament treaty. That is, to, that is um, the extent to which past production and stockpiles are dealt with. However, mitigation of discrimination is not just limited to whether or not to make a nuclear disarmament treaty. It is also important in the peaceful use of nuclear energy. Uh, energy. Under the NPT, uh, the reality is that only non-nuclear weapon states are ob obligated to accept strong safeguards, while safeguards for nuclear weapon states are only voluntary and are rarely applied in practice. Whether or not to apply safeguards to all civilian nuclear facilities of nuclear armed states under an FMCT is a subject of future negotiation. Um, but even so, nuclear weapon states would be required to assume verification obligations for those um, critical parts of their nuclear facilities that are deemed to be minimally necessary to achieve the objectives of an FMCT, such as enrichment and reprocessing facilities. The extent to which an FMCT can alleviate the discriminatory nature of the current NPT regime will depend on future negotiations, but the nuclear weapon states should approach the negotiations with a clear understanding of the importance of the mitigation of discrimination in non-nuclear weapon states and how important it is for the maintenance of the NPT regime, uh, which the nuclear armed states or at least the five nuclear weapon states value. There are other significances such as building a base for nuclear abolition as represented by the TPNW, strengthening nuclear security, mitigation of environmental and humanitarian impacts, increasing transparency, but I'll, I'll skip them due to time constraints. Perhaps I can talk about them later in the Q&A session. So now I'd like to move on to the second part of my remark today, which is um, three perspectives in considering how an FMCT should look like. Uh, first, um, it is necessary to always keep in mind the significance and purpose of an FMCT and to separate the ideal form and minimal form required for an FMCT to be meaningful uh, derived from its basic uh, purpose, with the ideal parts being subject to negotiation and the minimal parts to be established as consensual. For example, um, on the main issue of whether or not to include the stocks, there's an argument that in order to make the treaty a true nuclear disarmament treaty, it should be obligatory, obligatory to include the emanation of stocks. Of course, this would be ideal. But requiring stockpiles to be eliminated would have virtually the same effect as the TPNW. And since we already have the TPNW now, uh, we can leave that issue to the TPNW. An FMCT can now play the role of filling the gap between the TPNW and the status quo, uh, uh, the, the current status. So the elimination of the stock, stocks should be not a minimal form of an FMCT, but an issue subject to negotiation. On the other hand, it is not enough to simply ban the production of fissile material. Taking the consensus uh, FMC uh, fissile material production ban as a starting point, the minimum form, form of an FMCT should be derived from what obligations should be imposed to effectively secure the fissile material production ban. Anything beyond that uh, can be negotiated as an additional part. 
specifically prohibiting the production of fissile material means that uh, fissile material stocks must not be increased at least after an FMCT comes, in, comes to, into effect. What can be derived from this is that, for example, reversing fissile material, de fissile material declared excess uh, for national security back to nuclear weapons purposes should be prohibited since it effectively means production. Similarly, the closure and dismantling of fissile material production facilities or their conversion to non-nuclear weapons purposes should be mandatory. Um, these points uh, have been mainly Japanese working papers since 2006 and are also along with the lines of uh, Pavel's uh, draft paper. Uh, the second uh, uh, perspective in considering how an FMC should like, look like is um, that uh, there's a need for a concrete and precise break breakdown of what stock and deal with respectively mean in concrete terms, rather than a general and loose discussion whether or not to include stock or whether it should be a nuclear disarmament treaty or a non-proliferation non treaty. Um, stocks can be, for example, stocks can be categorized into various kinds as such as nuclear weapon stocks and non-nuclear weapon stocks. And non-nuclear weapon stocks can uh, be like excess stocks, civilian stocks, and non-prescribed military stocks. So for each of these uh, category, uh, it is necessary to break down the discussion into specifics on what should be prohibited and how they should be dealt with. Uh, these are also, uh, you know, uh, uh, discussed in Powell's paper. So I'll, uh, I'll just, I'll, I'll not really going to get into that uh, details. Um, but uh, if we break down the issue in this way, we can have a more constructive discussion and avoid political discussion of whether or not to include stocks in FMCT. Uh, the third perspective uh, is uh, to, to have an approach of a combination of principled and flexible. The scope of the obligation should be broad from a principled point of view, while the actual verification and implementation can be flexible in structure. For example, the issue of scope. We should separate the scope of the definition of fissile material whose production should be prohibited from the scope of um, uh, uh, fissile material that should be subject to verification. The scope, of, for example, the scope of, uh, for production ban should be broad from a principled point of view. However, the scope of verification can be flexibly considered. For example, as long as the amount of stocks for fissile material is still high, verification can be applied to most critical points such as enrichment and repulsing facilities from the cost benefit point of view. However, as disarmament progresses and the amount of fissile material decreases, the scope of verification can be gradually expanded to effectively secure and realize the purpose of an FMCT. Uh, my last uh, uh, part of my remark uh, is uh, possible ways forward. So negotiations in this CD are the most desirable and uh, should be should continue to be pursued. Uh, but if we continue to get nowhere, states should not hesitate to take uh, bold action. One way is to negotiate under the uh, United Nations. So before the TPNW negotiations, people were cautious about negotiating in the uh, United Nations because it was set a precedent and encouraged TPNW negotiations. But a precedent has already been set uh, with the TPNW being negotiated under the auspices of the UN. And so people no longer need to fear setting a precedent. And of course, negotiation under the UN need to be and can be inclusive. Uh, pending the start of the treaty negotiation in, in any forum, uh, CD or UN or wherever, a combination of various non-legally binding measures less than a treaty should be considered. The most typical example is the declaration of a moratorium on fissile material production. Another is transparency mechanism, as uh, Pavel's paper uh, extensively discusses. And for example, the importance of reporting of plutonium and HEU holdings under Infocirc 549 and 912. I'd like to just add that, that, that uh, as another existing mechanism that we should make most, of, most use of, there are a standard reporting form and report the repository system that was agreed in the 2010 NPT action plan, action 1221 actually. 
to be established under the UN Secretary General. It's unfortunate that even the standing, standard reporting form has not been really agreed to yet, although uh, N5 claim they do. In any case, information in the current national reports by the N5 is scattered and very difficult to grasp. In this sense, whatever the N5 claims, uh, the current national reports are not fulfilling the purpose of standard, standard reporting forms. Uh, in this in this vein, the NPDI has proposed standing uh, standard reporting form for both nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states, uh, which can be a useful reference point. Uh, I'll stop there. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Nishida. Uh, particularly the interesting thoughts on different ways forward, which I'm sure will raise some questions and, and uh, discussion here. Also, my apologies, we had a technical glitch on our side that left those of, those of us in the room <clears throat> unable to see you for a couple of minutes. Uh, the optimist in me very much sees the screen as being half full and we could hear you very clearly, so I didn't want to interrupt, but thank you, sir. Um, I now want to open the floor for question and answer, so if there are people who would like to raise any points, any questions or comments. If you're online, if I can encourage you to submit questions through the Q&A function, these will then be passed on to me. Uh, those of you in the room, um, please do raise your, your nameplates, and I can see a couple of nameplates raised already. Um, perhaps I can offer you the floor of the, to the distinguished representative of France, please, Ambassador Petty. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, Camille Petit, French Ambassador for Disarmament here in Geneva. Uh, thank you very much for uh, for this event and uh, for the draft report and for the discussion. Uh, FMCT is really of an utmost importance to uh, to my delegation. I, it is uh, really the first uh, item of our positive agenda towards nuclear disarmament. Um, I would like uh, just to um, to add a few elements that I think uh, could be usefully. Uh, added to uh, uh, the UNIDI report. <laughs> so, uh, uh, first of all, I, I would like to insist on uh, the dismantlement of the production sites. Uh, this is uh, a commitment uh, that uh, was uh, undertaken by France. Uh, as soon as uh, 1996, France uh, uh, undertook the dismantlement of its production units in Marcoul and uh, Pierre Latte. Uh, and it's a long-term investment. It's uh, uh, 12 billion, uh, 12 billion euro uh, cost, uh, but it also um, means a, a, a lot of, uh, of endeavour. Uh, so Pierre Latte was for uh, the uran uranium enrichment uh, plan, and it's now fully dismantled. Uh, and Marcoul, which uh, is uh, the, the plutonium one, the UP1 reprocessing plant, it be the dismantlement began in uh, 1997. It's still ongoing, but we can say that the irreversibility uh, the stage has been met uh, more than 10 years ago. Uh, so it's really an uh, unprecedented uh, commitment that I think it needs to be underlined. Uh, the second point, uh, briefly, uh, is that the fact that uh, it's so important to, to France that we actually put on the table uh, a draft a treaty in 2015. And um, it, it is meant for the CD because, of course, the CD is the uh, unique place where you can have all um, concerned states. Uh, and uh, negotiating on the basis of, uh, of consensus. And this is, uh, of course, uh, very important that all states concerned are part of the negotiations. Uh, maybe another element, because we mentioned stocks and information and transparency, so maybe two pieces of information. Um, uh, the first one is that um, France actually provides uh, yearly information on civilian stocks. Uh, I think that's something that uh, you mentioned. Uh, France is also part of the group of signatories uh, of the guidelines for the management of plutonium. Uh, so, uh, so, so there is, uh, there is uh, uh, transparency. Uh, of course, full transparency is dependent on the transparency on arsenals. It's not possible, and maybe that, that is something that uh, I, I haven't had time to re read in detail your report, but maybe it's something that you underlined, but that's very important. We need reciprocity. We, France has um, been extremely transparent in the, in, uh, the, um, uh, as regards its uh, doctrine and arsenals. 
nationals. And uh, we, we, we need this reciprocity to go further as regards uh, stocks. Uh, so I will stop here to let other people speak. But thank you again very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I think the, the elements in your remarks are, are noted. Uh, and perhaps before turning directly to the panel, we could take two questions. So I think there's a flag raised by Germany and then perhaps make it three. So if we go Germany, Brazil, then I'll turn to the panel. So, so uh, please, Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and also I would like to thank the um, um, Japan and, and in Unity for the work, and especially uh, Papal Potpik for the for the paper he just presented to us. I just have a, a, a brief uh, question to um, to the to the panelists. As, um, when I, I, I hadn't the chance to to to, to read the whole uh, the whole paper, but having a, a look into the conclusions, I, I read there, and I, I certainly agree that when um, um, it said um, while some of the issues. Um, that hold back the FMCT negotiations may present a serious challenge. Yes, I think uh, we all agree. But um, uh, it's that, that virtually all technical problems can be adequately addressed. And that was a point where I was just thinking um, if, um, first of all, um, uh, so they can be virtually addressed. So the question is, uh, have we addressed them all already, all the different aspects which were mentioned, which are also mentioned in the papers when it comes to, to, to stocks, to production, to verification, to, to transfers. I think there are a lot of, of technical questions which have to be addressed. And uh, we have an example, I think, uh, with the CTBT where we have um, uh, worked out these, these technical challenges, I would say, um, beforehand in a very intensive work um, facilitating in the end um, the, the negotiation of the treaty itself. So the question is, is this just um, have we um, uh, already addressed um, um, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the, the, all this, the, these, these technical um, uh, problems uh, which, are, which are raised here? And could this be an avenue to um, to come closer to uh, to a treaty in in concentrating on these technical issues? Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Carvel. Uh, perhaps if you could take one more. I think there was a flag at the back. Yes, Brazil, yes. Claudio, please. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, I would like to begin by uh, thanking uh, Unidir and uh, uh, the Japanese mission for organizing this debate. Uh, we still hope that uh, the CD will be able to agree on a substantive uh, program of work so that we can have this sort of substantive discussions. But uh, in any case, pending this, uh, we uh, very much appreciate this opportunity to discuss the F, the fissile material issue and to make sure that uh, this, the issue is fresh in the minds of the, all delegations and that um, perhaps new ideas can come about. Um, I'd like to uh, thank uh, the references that were made, in particular by Thomas, by, uh, about our proposal on a possible framework arrangement ag uh, agreement for the FMT. Uh, this was done through document CD slash 1888. It was reminded by my ambassador in his statement uh, earlier today. Uh, he also pointed towards uh, further refinement of this proposal, uh, which was made uh, through during the expert, the high-level expert preparatory group on an FMT, uh, uh, in which this idea was developed further. Uh, it is basically an approach that can be adapted uh, in accordance to what can be agreed uh, by 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 the CD. Uh, the original idea was for a uh, framework convention backed by two protocols, one dealing with future production and another one dealing with uh, uh, ex uh, existing stocks. But uh, we, this idea, as pointed out during the high-level expert preparatory group, can be uh, further developed. Not other protocols can be thought as we uh, progress in this uh, objective of making sure that the FMT or FMCT, however much you want to, uh, however, however you might want to call it, uh, that it should be a measure conducive to uh, the ultimate objective, which is the total elimination of, uh, of nuclear weapons. And I would also like to point out that uh, uh, discussions on nuclear dis dis disarmament verification can also be uh, uh, pegged to the, uh, uh, our consideration of possible mandate on an FMT. Uh, because uh, the verification measures that will be necessary for ensuring compliance with a fissile material treaty will probably be very similar or at least complementary to those that will have to be put in place uh, for nuclear disarmament. And I would like to again uh, do a shameless uh, 
uh, uh, uh, advertisement for our idea of establishing a group of scientific and technical experts on NDV, which has been discussed already in the context of the GGE on nuclear disarmament verification, and we hope that this discussion can be carried further. Thank you. My thanks to the distinguished representative of Brazil. We have three questions or sets of questions and comments to address, so perhaps we can take those first and then I'll turn to China subsequently, but perhaps if we could take the panelists' thoughts first. Do you want to go quickly, Pavel? Please, thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, my apologies if I forgot to mention the uh, uh, Marcoul and Pierre Lat. Uh, this is one of the uh, better examples, one of the great examples of the uh, transparency and confidence, and again, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the how this can be done. Uh, I, I think that the uh, the challenge there uh, is probably with with enrichment, uh, the because uh, some enrichment programs will be around, and they will be uh, some enrichment facilities will be converted rather than eliminated, and civilian enrichment facilities uh, will be. Uh, capable of producing a material. Uh, uh, however, I, I think it might be interesting to look at the uh, experience of Urenco uh, Consortium and uh, the way how uh, it manages uh, the, uh, the, the limit, the ban on production of uh, uh, material for weapons at the uh, Urenco facilities, whether they are in France and uh, Germany, uh, UK, or the United States. So I think that that might be an interesting, uh, uh, an interesting again uh, experience. Uh, to the uh, question of Germany, uh, virtually all uh, technical problem, problems can be addressed. I actually believe yes. I, I think the virtual is there uh, only because uh, there might be some work done on. Uh, naval material, uh, because uh, the, if, if you have the material produced for uh, military non-prescribed uh, pros purposes like for naval reactors, uh, there there is a bit of a technical challenge there, uh, but it is largely because uh, if you want to uh, give states uh, an excuse, of making things complicated by saying this is all very uh, sensitive and secret. Uh, so there are uh, other things are, I do believe that uh, the IEA has all the technologies, we know how to uh, monitor this and that. Uh, we've done uh, work, I get shameless self-promotion, on how to eliminate uh, materials, how to dismantle weapons without access to sensitive uh, data. So that, that all can be done. Uh, it is really uh, the um, uh, the matter of uh, of political will, as they say. But they, it's uh, again the technical issues have been done to the extent that they they haven't been solved. Uh, I think there is a yeah there 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 are diff various mechanisms, including probably the group of experts on uh, nuclear disarmament verification. Again, there there are. Uh, all kind of avenues for a discussion. So let me stop here. Thank you very much, Pavel. Um, Thomas, please. What's yours? Thank you very much, Jimmy. Um, yes, in response to the question from Germany, it is also Canada's position that um, the work that needs to be done in order to start negotiations has been effectively completed. Now, the, the high level. Uh, expert panel did make a reference to verification institutional and financial mechanisms may warrant some additional work but that would be quite normal for that to be undertaken while negotiations under, are underway of course you're only going to figure out the financial issues once you know what exactly the structure looks like that you will be setting up uh, and the same goes for institutional issues of course, delegations may differ in terms of what can be verified, particularly if you include um, existing stocks. Our view is that uh, it should be doable, but of course, uh, that's another reason why we want to start negotiations, to all sit down and be educated by other delegations, how they view things, and uh, to work together internationally to see what can be done and what can't be done, and that may then influence how a treaty looks like. But I think we have enough 
to, to uh, agree on a treaty dealing with fissile materials, how exactly the elephant look, will look like at the end is still, of course, to be negotiated. But uh, none of this should present an excuse not to get to the table. That's our, our position. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. And turning perhaps to you, Alonso, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you so much. So I think firstly, Ambassador, uh, Yes, of course, I, I think from Mexico perspective, we also consider that it is important uh, dismantling you know, or reconverting of existing facilities. We feel it is a fundamental part. We recognize obviously the work done by France in Marco and Pierre Latt. And so we understand there's many proposals within the city and obviously Mexico is part of the CD and willing to work on the CD. Just something I usually say in this and other topics is when states say, oh, the CD, there's all the relevant states. Yeah, well, there's other fora where all the members of the CD are also represented and even more states. And obviously we feel that as if we include more, more the merrier in the negotiations. But in the sense that it's and uh, it's not just uh, states there. And consensus rule, well, consensus rule, we've approved within other for uh, rules of consensus for decision making. And it's not just on the purview of the city, but we still obviously would be really encouraged because the city is the only multilateral fora uh, with specialization on negotiation on disarmament. And we can have dedicated space of seven, eight months of working five days a week on a specific negotiation as was done in the past of the city when we actually negotiated and actually dedicated seven, eight months just to one topic, constantly full time. So yes, that still is a benefit of the city, but I think that's how I approach the city as the most important or hopefully the place where we can run these negotiations. Uh, with the question of Germany, I think here, as we would see it is that there is an understanding that initially verification is viable with respect to the different aspects of the FMCT. So there's this general recognition that tools that might be viable exists. Obviously that does not mean that we already have them determined because as we have seen from the GGE and from the preparatory group, there's still important differences from definitions, from scope. So even when we speak of scope, it's like uh, future production, what is exactly future production? What are existing stocks? Existing stocks might include civilian, might be those in excess, might be those that are functionally in weapons and uh, nuclear weapons. So there are still debates uh, on obviously definitions. Is, are we going to use uh, a definition of the IEA? If such, which definition of the IEA? Will we need a special uh, definition on this treaty? I think those are aspects to be determined. But I think here, as we envisage, is there are overall, and as I think as Pavel has said, a general understanding that there are verification tools and that there are verification tools that either existing in other organizations as the IEA, other academic and technical studies on verification that respect proprietary rights, respect the obligation of the MPT not to give uh, uh, the access of, uh, of information to the production of nuclear weapons to non-nuclear weapon states. There are so, and there are therefore viable technical means to verificate that obviously will have to land onto the specific obligations and the specific definitions. And that is work that is still pending and that will be very substantive in this CD. And finally, we'll recognize obviously the work done by Brazil, uh, both in the FMCT and with regard to nuclear uh, disarmament verification. I think in the first 
I, I think the first obviously issue is form follows function that is always mentioned. And I think here, while the idea of a framework convention and with respective protocols might be a useful parameter, in the end, also we have to this uh, to determine other aspects. So, okay, if we're going to go through a framework convention, are the protocols have to be negotiated at the same time? Would they need to be entering into force at the same time, or they might have delayed entering into force? There are aspects of the interrelationships of them. So I think there are still obviously questions, but I think it's beneficial obviously to have those kind of proposals that understand the comprehensive approach to FMCT and the differentiated aspect that I think was uh, relevant from my perspective of Pavel's uh, study. So, and just nuclear disarmament verification, I think also as Pavel said, that includes disarmament material within its discussion paper, clearly links that there's an interrelationship between FMCT and nuclear disarmament verification without necessarily being equal to it, so. Thank you. Thank you, Alonso. Um, I, I'm apolog apologies in advance. I may take us slightly over time, and I'm still very keen to take the question from China. But if we could hear from Professor Nishida first, then I'll turn to the floor. So sorry to keep you waiting. But Professor Nishida, uh, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you very much for uh, the uh, comments and the questions. Um, so the uh, uh, issue of uh, dismantling of production sites, uh, yes, I, I, I actually was going to uh, mention that, but I skipped uh, in my remark due to time constraints. Uh, yes, so the closure and dismantling of fissile materials should be uh, mandatory in an FMCT and also reversing uh, those like converted facilities back to nuclear weapons purposes uh, means de facto production. So that reversing should also be prohibited. Um, in, in, in terms of the reciprocity, uh, I uh, I very much understand uh, that uh, aspect uh, from the uh, national security or international politics perspectives, uh, but at the same time, there there are um, you know a nuclear disarmament, non-proliferation, global uh, interest. So uh, in that sense, uh, you know uh, recipro reciprocity is not, a, not necessarily a dominant factor. Uh, with regard to the question on the uh, uh, from the German. Uh, Ambassador, uh, so I don't I don't think uh, technical uh, issues are resolved and uh, need negotiations. Uh, I mean, uh, issues need negotiations, uh, but I believe um, uh, technical issues are pretty much addressed, and we know the issues and where states stand at. Uh, so I wouldn't say establishing group of scientific experts is meaningless, but um, what is needed now is political will. I guess I think we have reached a point where. Uh, once there is political will to start negotiations, uh, we are ready. Uh, yeah, thank you. Oh, thanks to the distinguished representative of China for your patience. The floor is yours, sir. Uh, thank you. Thanks for giving me the floor and thanks for convening uh, this FMCT event. FMCT is uh, one topic uh, uh, discussed under Agenda 2. Uh, preventing uh, prevention of uh, nuclear war, uh, one of the core four core uh, agenda items of the CD. Uh, uh, China's stance on uh, uh, FMCT is uh, very uh, unfamiliar for you. I, th I will not repeat them, but I will highlight some of them, uh, which is shared by uh, many uh, delegation. Just as uh, you know, friend, uh, the, 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 just as Ambassador Pitet just said. Uh, CD uh, is the uh, uh, the only uh, appropriate forum to uh, start such a negotiation, and uh, China supports uh, CD uh, in formulating uh, uh, a compress comprehensive and balanced work and start uh, negotiations on FMCT uh, with the participation of all relevant parties, based on uh, in accordance with the Shannon mandate. And on the uh, the, the uh, moratorium, I will not repeat it. Uh, we think that there's no uh, clear uh, definition, uh, uh, neither a defi a clear definition or scope, and it's not a verifiable, and it has hardly meaningful. And uh, as uh, 
Dr. Uh, uh, Pavel Podovich mentioned, mentioned during his presentation that China uh, suspended uh, reporting uh, its uh, you know, uh, civil uh, nuclear activities uh, since uh, 2019. I would like to add more information, so uh, make it less misleading that it's uh, uh, it's a voluntary, it's not you know mandatory or, or, or obligation for China. And uh, also one more information I would like add, uh, just like a French uh, ambassador Peter said, uh, we also have some uh, you know uh, measures. Uh, you know, China scaled back its nuclear weapons development and production base as early as uh, the 1980s. China uh, shut down the A16 nuclear uh, military material production plants in the city of Chongqing. Uh, it can uh, deep in the mountains at the total cost of uh, uh, some 136 million yuan and demonstrated China's determination to take an in initiative in uh, restra uh, restraining the development of uh, China's nuclear forces as well as a principled non-pursuit of a nuclear arms race under any circ circumstances. Uh, and the sides uh, of uh, both these spaces are open to public. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, the second comment, and for the third one, is that I noticed that many delegations pointed out that uh, the aim of uh, uh, FMT negotiations should not focus only on nuclear disarmament, but also uh, nuclear non-proliferation. Uh, in this sense, I noticed the page 22 of uh, this discussion paper, there's the table. Uh, list the uh, countries that uh, hold held, uh, you know, HEU and uh, plutonium, and also list uh, the, uh, the the total tons uh, uh, held by other countries, and the the amount is around is uh, around fifty one tenth of the total plutonium of the whole uh, world uh, stockpile, and. Uh, as we say, you know, it's not an obligation or, or a respons responsibility of uh, nuclear weapon states to uh, uh, in, in this regard. So I think we should have a breakdown of this uh, other countries in the stockpile, you know, because this amount is not, uh, you know, small. It's quite prominent, uh, you know, I, I think to make it more uh, complete. It's my comment. I hope uh, that will be uh, uh, helpful for this discussion paper. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment and indeed your patience in waiting to take the floor. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm going to turn quickly to the panelists for very brief responses. If there's any other additional closing points you'd like to raise, um, please do so. Michelle, do you want to, could I ask you to keep it brief? Uh, uh, please go ahead. Thank you so much, James. Um, it's, it's unfortunate that we don't have enough time, and uh, I would try to be very brief. I would not uh, repeat the statements that we normally deliver at the CD uh, on this issue. First of all, I think very useful event, very useful exercise. Some of the conversation points that have come forward, and I would just like to draw attention, perhaps that merit further consideration and discussion uh, in the points is, uh, first of all, is the issue of uh, what Mr. Pavel uh, began his presentation with, the 83% material, uh, the numbers that he cited, the HU stockpile and uh, the plutonium stockpile. So at the heart of the issue is the existing stockpiles and what to do with that. Uh, reading the discussion paper, we felt that perhaps what was missing was this further elaboration of different categories of this stockpiles. Uh, we do note that, of course, the material in excess, uh, in excess has been uh, cited. But as far as we see it, we see that there are three distinct categories. One is for the nuclear weapons. Uh, the other is one is that access to nuclear weapons. And third is, of course, the uh, other uh, civilian and uh, non-proscribed military uses. But even in the nuclear weapons category, there is then the stockpiles which are already in weapons, and then there are others which are outside weapons which have not been uh, declared 
uh, or perhaps reserved for weapons, or perhaps in some cases called as strategic stockpiles or uh, uh, whatever the terms that are often used. And then other subcategory could be the dismantled, what is coming from the dismantled warheads. So in order to address this issue comprehensively, it's important to look at the each subcategory and not ignore one at the cost of the other so that there is no loophole in that. Another loophole I think that uh, I discovered uh, that came out uh, from this, uh, this discussion paper was also that would simply banning the future production, uh, does, it, does it close all the possibilities of increase in arsenals, in warheads? What about the possibility where even if the future production is banned, but still the material that has already been produced can be used for further increase in the arsenal at one stage or the other. And this is this point goes in addition to what Alonzo had said as well, the unintentional uh, accelerated uh, production, uh, if there is just a cutoff ahead that the states foresee. Uh, so that is also one point. And I think I'll just finish here uh, by uh, one very interesting uh, point highlighting that. I think that came out during the presentation of the panelists as well. That uh, we, this constant theme in the paper and today in the discussions, that there does not appear to be a technical obstacle in terms of handling the stockpiles, the existing stockpiles. So the issue, what we have often heard perhaps in the past, is that perhaps there is more technical difficulty to address the issue of existing stockpile. So it's not that. Um, the issue also why the, the past initiatives such as trilateral initiatives or PMDA, they fell apart, was not because there was no technical solution to handle those stockpiles, but it was also because of the main reason was the lack of political will, lack of engagement. So the issue of existing stockpile is more related uh, with the, and an issue of not reducing or eliminating those stockpiles is mostly linked with the lack of political will rather than the absence of any technical solution. And this point could be further elaborated. I have a number of other points, but perhaps uh, look forward to contributing in these discussions uh, with Dr. Pavel and other uh, colleagues and panelists. And congratulations once again on this uh, interesting work. And we look forward to further engagement on this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ocean. Um, we're always happy to speak further with you on this topic. I'm very conscious of the time, very appreciative of your patience. So rather than giving everybody the, the panelists the floor, does anybody particularly want to take the floor to respond to any of the questions or points raised? Um, pa Pavel, you, you, if you could keep yeah, it brief. Thank up. you. Very briefly, uh, the many good points. Uh, I uh, agree that uh, breaking down this, uh, the arsenals to different categories uh, is helpful. Uh, we, we've done so in the past, our report on the elim simplifying elimination of stocks. Uh, there is a further breakdown. So uh, on the uh, issue raised by uh, uh, China, I, I think, uh, well, the others, uh, they are others because they are, their material is under IA safeguards. So that's, uh, we, uh, to the extent that we trust IA uh, to keep that material in peaceful use, I think uh, we, we, we can be uh, s safe about that material. So let me stop here because these are, and thank you again for your interest and for your attention. Thanks, Pamela. Thomas, you wanted to briefly respond to me, please. Just very briefly, of course, we recognize the efforts by France and China in, in shutting down production facilities. That's, of course, much appreciated. Um, the CD asked the right forum. The CD is a good forum where the key states are that need to make, make progress on this issue, where they are represented. Uh, it would be a waste to let the CD go to waste, but that's where it's heading. So uh, for us, the key issue is that the key states that need to deal with this issue, namely the, the producers and possessors, that they are at the table. There's no point going to the UN if they don't come along. But if they do come along, you know, we are agnostic on the forum. Uh, same for the consensus principle. It's probably needed to get everyone on board, but you know we can be flexible on that. It is really the political will 
of all those nine states that's uh, required. Technical issues versus political will with Pakistan addressed. Well, we rather have, don't have a discussion uh, prior to starting negotiations on what's technically feasible or not. Generally, we believe things are technically feasible, but that, again, should be sorted out at the negotiating table. Perhaps some of these issues are more difficult or not, but that is that should not be pre-negotiated. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, Alonso, did you wish to follow up on any points? Or... Okay, good to keep it well, thank you, and I think, well, thank you, China, for bringing the information. I think my only reaction probably would be that, yes, probably now the accountability and transparency is voluntary with regard to plutonium, but I think what we would be expecting, at least from Mexico, is that FMC team make it compulsory. And that's the difference from where we are to what we expect to have with an FMCT. But obviously to recognize that an enormous amount of work has been done, that the CD has, have, has been studying this mandate for a long time. And obviously for us, we find it fundamental to actually start negotiations on the FMCT. We, we feel that it is an important measure within the broader scope of multilateral negotiations towards leading towards the achievement and maintaining of a, a world free of nuclear weapons. And, uh, and yeah, Mexico will remain engaged in a constructive manner. And we hope everyone without uh, prejudices or undue restrictions, we can actually start the substantive work. Thank you. Thank you, Alonso. And, uh... Professor Nishida, are there any further comments from your side at all? Oh, thank you. Um, just wanted to uh, point out the need for a sense of urgency. Um, even in the late 2000s, when I was uh, working hard in Geneva to launch negotiations, uh, we were already strongly advocating with a sense of urgency given the security environment uh, surrounding Japan. But now security environment is even much worse than it was. And uh, I personally have a even greater sense of urgency. So, I mean, this sense of urgency was not shared by many countries in the 2000s, but now, especially since the war in Ukraine, uh, I'm hopeful that uh, it will be shared by more countries. Uh, it is not a present situation at all, but I hope that this will be an opportunity for countries to break the stalemate with a strong sense of urgency to start negotiations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Um... Just a reminder, the working paper will be online for a couple more days before we take this down to finalise. We are happy to discuss this further, and I know there are some copies of the report, hard copies with some ominous-looking highlighting on, so if people do want to go and follow up on any of those points, we're happy to do so. Also, before closing, if I could encourage any online feedback, any feedback you may have, there are forms on the table, and there is an online form as well. Um, it is useful, it's also anonymous, and it does help us. And with that, uh, unless there's anything else from anybody else, I'd just like to express a thanks to all our speakers today and for you all joining us in person or online. Thank you for your patience. Apologies for going over for 15 minutes. Um, but also thanks to my colleagues, to Maria and to Sarah Ruth for their support. And thank you again to the government of Japan for generously supporting this work on the FMCT. Thank you all and have a good afternoon, colleagues.